Hello, welcome back everybody. I'm uh, Rufo Guareschi again. Um, we're now introducing the Challenge B, uh, which is uh, the core uh, panel uh, of our event. Our event is called Free and Safe in Cyberspace, uh, specifically to talk about the possibility of, and also the how, of uh, um, reconciling the quest for uh, meaningful e-privacy and the quest for um, effective cyber investigation capabilities, which are assumed to be an either or. In, in, uh, in this event, we have, you know, starts from, from, from an intuition that it may be not an either or, but a both or neither. That we start from the uh, assumption that today, now by looking at deeply at the recent uh, revelations of the last two, three years, there is a very deep proof that you have no meaningful privacy whatsoever. Some technologies have been mentioned, Signal and uh, Cryptophones or Tor and so on. Th all of those are scalably attackable, but not only by states, by uh, n large sets of criminals with medium capabilities and medium funding. And they can do it scalably with low cost for many thousands of users. There's ways to manage these, uh, these, uh, these users once they're exploited. Now, Akin team had this, NSA has a program, Turbine, Fox Acid, and that's the status of security and privacy of citizens. Let's look at the government and their, the tools they use for um, doing cyber investigation. Let's, talk, let's focus on the endpoint investigation, so targeted investigation, which is massive. No? So it is targeted, but it is massive because of the things that we said. So these tools, uh, uh, when we saw hacking team, uh, the, the, the source code of a major provide, world provider of tools for the management of malware that are used by uh, governments, by militaries to spy on suspects' uh, endpoint devices, has been uh, publicly released and it w it, it's been uh, publicly analyzed how this code and the code base they use are under the standards of a corporate application. So they're presumably, uh, <laughs> almost surely, you know, um, vulnerable to attacks for even medium sized uh, attackers that can come inside the systems, sp spy what they're spying into, and possibly even compromise the integrity of what they're doing. And that's on the server side. Then these systems are used uh, to uh, insert and then uh, manage malware that, that is implanted in the end user devices. And this, uh, this, uh, also, this malware also is not conceived to standards which enable an, a, a, a control of what's happening. So much so that many co uh, courts uh, have, uh, have refused to, um, to accept the, the, the validity of evidence acquired in this way. So much so that, the, as we mentioned before, the Ministry of Interior of Germany and France have said that they want to uh, explore a way to mandate all IPT providers to provide a service-side access to lawful access requests just because now they, they, they can go into uh, people's devices, but the evidence they get, they can't, it doesn't stand up in court for good reasons, because there are no standards which are suitable enough. So what we're looking in this panel, I mean, it's kind of specific, but uh, is basically we, we, uh, we're not looking if a new law on back or state mandated backdoors could work. We're looking if there are standards which would be non-governmental, could be set in place for how a IT provider complies to a lawful access request. We've seen Apple, you know, they had a request, you know, oh, please, we have this, uh, this uh, suspect and so on, we need this information. Well, this, infor this uh, process is, is handled today by uh, attorneys within uh, corporate organizations whose agenda we have no idea uh, what it is. And it's handled by a technical infrastructure within this, uh, uh, this, uh, these companies, which we don't know any th anything about. So we have no idea to how vulnerable this, uh, this uh, lawful access r compliance uh, processes by companies work. So we think that uh, the same extreme standards for securing your communications could be applied to the ways in which a, a, a secure, uh, a ultra high assurance uh, IT security provider could comply to lawful access requests. And so therefore, it could be possible uh, I mean, this is uh, object to debate, uh, that uh, um, by creating systems for lawful access compliance, which are so trustworthy, then the government would let but, but in, in, uh, in the market because there could be The last thing I should mention is that there are some problems that arise from this, that if we achieve these kind of levels of assurance 
by having publicly available designs of all the critical components, hardware and software, then we have a problem of what if a, an enemy or terrorist state or a terrorist group uses these designs to fabricate by themselves some devices which are beyond uh, Western intelligence. That's a very crucial problem. Well, we'll be looking at, in, uh, uh, at that in some research proposals. And so there are some uh, really tough issues uh, to look into. So uh, l l let me uh, pass on uh, the, the word to, uh, to the panel, uh, moderated by uh, Jennifer Baker from uh, Ars Technica, which will be moderating. And uh, so uh, enjoy the show. Thank you. Um, one of the concepts that I've been working on uh, for quite some time doing research in the technical issues surrounding this issue is the concept of uh, what we call revocable privacy. And the idea here is that um, we have been looking at technologies uh, and ways to design systems in such a way that you, before you design a system, uh, declare and, and, and specify uh, exactly the, the way the system works and also declare what you think are the, say, the rules of engagement as users of this system. So let me give an example, uh, and that this, this will also this example will also show the limitations of this approach. So this is not definitely not the final answer to, to the issue. Um, so for instance, in the Netherlands we have we have like um, uh, laws that that say something about how fast you can drive on the public roads. And these are very clearly specified. Yeah, I mean, there's certain parts of the roads you can drive 120 kilometers an hour, and in, in, in cities it's 50 kilometers an hour. Um, so in a way, we have this 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 uh, uh, this this rule in our society saying that uh, you should you should not be speeding. Uh, and then the question is, can we uh, design a system in such a way that we uh, can uh, detect speeders and make them public, while if you don't speed, nobody knows where you are. So this is the this is the essential idea behind this, what this this concept of revocable privacy. You design systems such a way that if you uh, abide the rules, you have total privacy. Nobody knows the system doesn't know. Nobody can get data about what you do with the system. However, if you trespass the rules, you uh, you will be uh, uh, found out. You will be uh, your details will be pu published in one way or another. It could be like totally public or just revealed to the authorities. I mean that's that's sort of up to how you design the system. Now, um, so this, this, this shows, at least from, from, a, from, from a very theoretical perspective, that you can actually both satisfy privacy requirements and security requirements. However, I'm also very well aware of the fact that like making a system, for instance, a system that automatically enforces speeding um, is way beyond what we're doing currently. And you know, this, this is still a, d a, d a debate that we should be having in society, whether you actually want a system like that. And I think that that's, that's the main point of our research, is actually by showing that um, you can design systems in a way that, that satisfy both privacy and security requirements. The debate that we should be having is, what are the security requirements? What, what, what kind of enforcement do we want to have in society when talking about public infrastructures like roads or uh, internet services? Thanks. I really appreciate this kind of concept uh, of revocable privacy, and uh, I totally agree with you, first of all. What I can say is that uh, <coughs> this is a not realistic uh, scenario for the time being, uh, but uh, because, because, for example, <coughs> I mentioned one legal example, if you want to have this kind of experience, uh, the data retention uh, decision of the ECJ, uh, that happens uh, in 2014, so last past, uh, la uh, past two years from that decision. And uh, I think that uh, a few states applied that decision in their country, for example, the Italian situation, and the Spanish situation, the Portuguese situation, they, they didn't apply this decision in their uh, constitutional court. They can change the law, and we have already the data retention issue. Why? Because the data protection uh, uh, authority in Italy is not so strong enough, uh, forgive me <laughs> if I <laughs> comment about this, and there is a lot of pressure from the law enforcement authorities that need this kind of data log uh, and other kind of files. So there is a, a tension between privacy and security, even if it's true that theoretically privacy and security are not in contrast. So this is my point of view. Yeah, 
Yes, yeah, so we, we have our own experience, which also states that or can, can be summarized as not all access that is wanted by law enforcement is al already lawful. A big deal of that is trying out how far they can get to going directly to providers saying, I want your data. And even uh, the judicial um, uh, decisions, so a, a lawyer, a, a judge who has to sign something is not a reliable case right now. And this has been also noti noticed by our constitutional court uh, saying that um, meanwhile uh, we cannot rely on, a, uh, um, uh, on something which is happening previously. The, the judges have no chance to really understand and to decide on the, on the cases. And often they don't know which data is really necessary to find out something. So they have to, have to well, only to sign. But uh, this has been now um, uh, led to a, a change in our system uh, um, because of this trend that the Constitutional Court has said, and this is again um, 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 pr promoting us, our role a, a little bit more, that DPAs now have the obligation to check after the fact. Um, and not in each individual fact, but uh, for example, every two years we have, we, there's the, the, the law court decisions, we have to check uh, what uh, uh, the databases contain and the police and secret s service stuff. Uh, and um, at least every uh, se uh, second year we have to do that. And meanwhile, the list of databases has grown. So this is the new trend saying we, we cannot control beforehand. We should control after the fact. And this means the DPAs th who are independent in what they are doing, they still have the obligations to check. And then because everybody knows that there are checks after the fact, th this should be done. But this is not sufficient, I think, uh, to check after the fact because then again, what has been documented, is it still in the database? base, what about deletion times, there might have happened something which has not been well documented and how to find out about that. And also about the transparency um, of the suspects or, or others, who, who gets to know that they were part of a, of a proce uh, procedure there. And right now, of course, uh, the police argumentation is if uh, you are the suspect and we come to you say, now you have to go, uh, we, we, uh, we, we, we know you, you have done something bad, you are a criminal, then you are informed. But uh, there are many by bystanders and uh, they might have been part of the procedures and the data may have s still been stored in the databases and they are never informed. And uh, although this is a theory or a nice principle saying everybody has to be informed, then there are so many ways as ah, but uh, there are many if, uh, it takes effort to inform everybody. It may um, weaken the trust, I say trust here, because uh, other for the technical system we need trustworthiness, but weaken the trust in society if people know that they have been part of some, some legal procedure, that they know that their mobile phone has logged in in a way where they were part of some, some uh, criminal investigation, but I, we argued the other way around. No, it's necessary to have these controls. And on the um, revocable privacy, of course, uh, I think privacy is very necessary. Um, if it's something where you can find out in a, a context-specific setting, uh, this was really um, not abiding the rules, so speeding. It's quite okay or, or easy to implement, but if it's something like, um, I have the feeling that Rufo uh, has communicated something uh, to another person, and this means I revoke his privacy, uh, and there's no nothing where we already know that you have done something wrong, and it's so basic as only communicating with or having logged in somewhere. This m may be something where it's not so easy to implement in a way uh, where we really, again, see the trustworthiness of the system. So the automatic speeding means finding out. I think this may be easy, but the general... Yeah, the speeding example is maybe a, a, a very simple example. Let me give another example. Actually, what that was the, it was the motivating example that 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 started off the investigation and started off finding solutions for this problem. Um, and I was told this example, I think now four or five years ago, uh, where uh, in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands at least, and maybe it's also in other countries, there there's the problem of the so-called canvas cutters, and these are criminal gangs that uh, travel on highways and go to each and every parking space to see if there's lorries, and then cut the canvas of the lorries open to see if there's valuable stuff inside. If there is, they will send another team to pick the, the truck, or at least the lorry, uh, and steal it at night. So the, the, this is something that was happening five or six years ago in the Netherlands, and then the police were like, hmm, this is, this is, this 
criminal activity is increasing, what can we do about it? What they did was install um, uh, cameras on the uh, entry points of every parking space on highways with uh, automatic number plate recognition systems. And the reasoning was that uh, a canvas cutter would visit each and every parking lot. So if you would, you basically what they would do is just they would like collect all the number plates of all the cars visiting all the parking places along a certain stretch of highway, then correlate all the recordings of every uh, parking space and see if there was a number plate that would pop up several times along this stretch of highway. Now, of course, this would be th this would be the, the the supposedly criminal people. It would also pick up the police cars or the maybe the AA because the, these guys also visit lots of parking spaces. Uh, but they were also very aware of the fact that they were collecting like very uh, personal identifiable information because they basically were collecting whoever was parking at a, a parking space. And they were actually, um, they were running an experiment. And um, during that experiment, something uh, something else happened. I think somebody got, got um, uh, murdered or harassed along this particular sp uh, stretch of highway. So there was another police department basically coming to them, like, hey, guys, you're doing this experiment. Can we have a number plate? of everybody. And they were like, yeah, but that was not totally the ID. And I was, and I was, they were presenting this case and I was thinking, can we make something where you, uh, you, you do the recording of the number plates, but immediately encrypt them in such a way that you can only decrypt them if the same number plate was seen in another few parking places. So the rule is not as simple as you know, you know, just speeding. You can make different kinds of rules. And so the whole idea of this revocable privacy is then, can we uh, have a discussion about the kinds of, because this is a kind of profiling thing that police do. And they do it, they do it all the time. Uh, so that's not, um, th now they do it in a, in a totally unprotected way. And the, the, the idea was, can we do it in a more controlled and protected way by saying, okay, can we compile these profiles within the infrastructure so that the only data that comes out is the data that actually matches the profile and no other data. Okay, uh, Reinhard, but I mean, I must point out that these tremendously sophisticated criminals didn't think that they could just maybe change the number plates. I mean, it's so easy and obvious to work around that I, I wonder about the idea of whether that was the real intention because, you know, you create a data source and there's always going to be mission yeah. creep. There is organizations that <laughs> change the number plates every... <laughs> <laughs> every so often. <laughs> no, that's not it. <laughs> now, I, I'm, I'm coming from informatics. Uh, uh, why I'm saying that? I'm, I'm sort of missing the definition of the problem. We, we, we uh, talk about constitutional lawful access, and uh, in the same sentence, we talk about backdoors. Th that has nothing to do with each other. Yeah. Uh, Backdoors would be like, uh, g going back to your example, would be like building cars that are not able, or, or that tell that you are speeding, or, or we could just build cars that are not able to speed, uh, to go over speed. Uh, so uh, uh, that, that, uh, that, that's a totally different decision. Uh, when it comes to uh, lawful access, we have to uh, look where are we doing lawful access, and lawful access in general means that you are asking for information that is there, not asking for collecting information. That's totally different. Uh, I, I, you know, asking for collecting information um, turns everyone in the room into suspects somehow. And uh, th that's from a legal principle very complicated. And we have totally different laws in Europe. You have to be aware of that. For example, we in Austria cannot ask a suspect. A suspect is allowed to tell you the wrong things without being, uh, you know, without having any consequence. If you're accused, you're, you're allowed to say nothing. You're allowed to say the wrong things. That's, that's your right. If you're a witness, that's totally different. So going uh, to the lawful aspect to a third party means totally different things uh, than going to the person. Uh, going back to lawful access, we, we need sort of a court order which goes against a person in general. It can't go against a machine. A machine cannot be criminal, per definition. Only a person can be a criminal. Now, uh, you only can, uh, y you would require to have uh, appropriate identification. Uh, assuming that the information 
you know, uh, uh, under X, Y, Z, was uh, uh, is uh, is uh, your information in general will not be uh, enough evidence that uh, a lawful access can be issued, uh, uh, you know, order can be issued against this conviction. So we have lots of things, and we we need a way better definition of the problem. Uh, and w then, then we can talk about wha wha what is lawful access. Uh, uh, wh where do we uh, see backdoors that would be limitation on products? We, we then would say there are is n there's n you cannot allow to import products at the end because you you would say you need to add products with the lawful w with the backdoors, now which means you, you sort of have to. Uh, have to have a trust into those who, or, or legal hand on the, or those who <laughs> built that. It's it's ways more complicated as you uh, go into that uh, than uh, saying you we need backdoors. You know, we need backdoors. It's nice. Uh, uh, might be in one or the other uh, uh, setup uh, seen as useful, <coughs> but the feasibility is extremely complicated. Well, let me ask then: when you you do have lawful, constitutional lawful access means, um, and authorities still try to circumvent it. I'm thinking of the, the Microsoft warrant case um, where there's emails, we know they're there in the data center in Ireland, the drug dealer, you know, or I don't know if he's been convicted yet, and the US courts, instead of going through the standard MLAT procedures to, you know, ask the Irish authorities to go and get their emails, decided to just order Microsoft, because Microsoft's a US company, to hand it over. Now Microsoft has resisted. That, that and is not lawful access. Well, this lawful what I'm access means yeah. you, as a policeman, get there without yeah. notice, what have you, and you access. Yeah. The other thing is you ask for approve, what have you. Mm. Uh, that, uh, but but lo w w what we have in um, I, I because we had a, uh, an extensive discussion on that years ago, uh, it's uh, very feasible and happens in practice that. Lawful access means that someone, while you are not at home, comes at your home, installs something into your computer which you might not see even or notice, and then gets hold of your data. That is backed up with legal, uh, with a legal framework. While going on the, uh, on the internet to the provider and assuming that this data comes from you is way, way different because someone could use your e ID. Well, if I was a criminal, I would not use my ID. Uh, <coughs> the ID to uh, so that that's why I said we need to specify the problem before we have uh, the the specified the problem we cannot talk about solution. Okay, everyone. That's a very good point. Uh, basically, uh, the examples for for revocable privacy uh, relate more to uh, physical privacy so privacy in the physical world and uh, uh, also security in the physical world so basically o also this uh, sort of things related to the relate to devices so access to devices this is also physical if you can have access to device how to uh, have access to data recover the keys and whatever but uh, basically we should, so this is the, uh, the problem that we are dealing with. Uh, we should concentrate not on these physical things in the discussion, uh, but uh, rather to data. So it's only data. So we ha it's cyber privacy and it's cyber security. So we have an endpoint user who decides to apply some crypto techniques for end-to-end po end point encryption, for example. This is one uh, example. The other is to use some anonymity tools like anonymous credentials, uh, which provide also uh, unlinkability. Uh, and then uh, you want to enable lawful access, so they are using that uh, in time, lawful access to that data, so, so this sort of data <laughs> afterwards. So not in, in real time, also afterwards, backwards in time, in some period of time. So we are dealing strictly with cyber privacy, cyber security, with data. And then uh, in that case, we are dealing with these crypto systems, basically, that are applying some crypto algorithms. They're using some keys there. And then you have this security chain. So uh, we want to identify the technologies, how, in fact, to read the data afterwards. 
it was encrypted, it was anonymously, whatever, I d uh, using these anonymous uh, credentials protected. Then later you want to revoke anonymity. Later you want to read the encrypted data. So this, uh, the, th this is the problem that we are considering. And then in that case, unfortunately, I don't want to, to, to talk any more about that. We are dealing with this security chain. We are dealing with elements of the security chain. And then uh, this is what I would like to propose. And in fact, so, uh, uh, this, this is the point also from my talk. There are only two ways, technological is to build backdoors anywhere in the chain, also in, in the key management, so key storage and whatever, or to allow uh, uh, lawful access to key, so key recovery. So this, these are the only two technological means there. So, uh, uh, but it should be under strictly controllable conditions. So this is sort of key escrow, shared key escrow. Uh, this is the case currently with end-to-end -end, uh, encryption, we don't have any other solutions. This is also with anonymous credentials for revocable anonymity. They have the, uh, can have the property of revocable, but uh, revocable anonymity. But uh, uh, there is uh, then the key, and then you, <laughs> in fact, have key recovery there. So we don't know any other solutions e except those. So I advocate key recovery, uh, shared key escrow, <laughs> Uh, as opposed to backdoors, because backdoors make systems insecure, uh, whereas key recovery is, to me, is uh, something legitimate. Well, I like a fight, so go on, Reinhard. <laughs> <laughs> Just. Very simple reasons. I think it exists. It will just. <laughs> uh, it will. That's the. That's the, 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 the dump thing. Well, uh, E2 with the key 2. And Which you don't see. So, uh, unless. Only a certain set of products which. I want to support it, but I also, maybe if I may broaden the debate a bit. When we're discussing lawful access, we got a very good view on what is the current regime in Austria and in every country will be different. But this, this discusses how in the old world, in the physical world, how the law gave access to police. But today, the reality is that we have actually law enforcement for like the, the petty criminals, the thieves, uh, the people who steal from trucks. And then we have like terrorism, which more fuzzy and much smaller, and then of course you have also intelligence. You go after everything, after foreign companies and whatever. And I don't know, but I'm not a lawyer, but I think that most countries think it's also legal to spy on other people. Companies, other companies. So this is is this lawful access or not? This is a very interesting. I guess lawyers can discuss this. I'm completely incompetent, <laughs> but the question. I think the reality is that we have models from the physical world where people place bugs, where people tap phone lines. And then we try to apply them to our current ICT systems. But the reality is that today, some players already have figured out what they have to do, which is mass surveillance. And we think of targeted surveillance as doing things specifically listening to this phone call, a bug in this guy's car, or putting some malware in one computer. But what we know today, the reality is that there is mass surveillance. And then we ask, targeted questions, and so it becomes targeted surveillance. But we first collect everything. This is the essence of data retention, which was shut down by the European Court of Justice, but apparently it doesn't matter whether our higher court shut is down. Some countries just think it's, it's, it's irrelevant what the highest court says because they need this. And so I think that's the core of the debate. If, 
we have our systems are so weak that they're vulnerable to mass surveillance. And then we have target surveillance, what we want. So how do these two things match? I think this is the big problem. Police wants to operate by mass surveillance and then ask targeted questions. I think that's the core of the debate. I think and the other side is we don't need to put back doors or do QS scroll because our systems are so insecure today anyway that you know it's something the police have a lot of metadata. I mean of course they can't use the tempera system or X key score deep dive, but then they have actually all the metadata which they can legally acquire. I think the, the old world with bugs or breaking in and having a look at the clear text or so, this is still existent. And I think this may be part of the solution that the police, under very high circumstances and conditions, of course, uh, can still use that because at some point in time the, the encrypted text will be there in clear text. So otherwise it's, it's no use usually. Send in encrypted emails which are never decrypted well. So this may be something where, of course, the effort is very big. You need so much of knowledge already. Um, you cannot look back into the in the past. There are many limitations unless you you make use of everything which the mass surveillance um, services have already collected. Um, so even with a secure system, there's still the possibility saying this is now the guy. I have to go there. I have to break in, and this is a it's, it's an infringement, of course, uh, going to the the apartment. But it, th the good thing is that it's not a scalable solution for mass surveillance on the other side. So, d like discriminating everybody who's in the opposition, like uh, having a big deal on uh, kicking out some, some, ex some um, percentage of, of society. It really takes much effort, but this is not a bug in my perspective, but it's a feature. And for on the rest, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Just a small question to Bart. Do, do you believe that we can actually design systems in such a way that mass surveillance becomes sufficiently hard? But, I mean, because if that's not the case, then we can stop. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, I think we've got to, I mean, are we arguing from a point of view where we accept, but not accept, but understand that mass surveillance, or I believe they're calling it bulk surveillance now in order to, in, in privacy shield, um, is going to happen? Or do we expect to lobby our politicians and change our laws and actually stop that level of, you know, I mean, are we trying to, find a technological solution to what is a cultural problem. But it happens anyway today. So and then the question was to me, can you think and do it? Yes, I think I'm an optimist. I think we can do it, but it's probably very hard. On the bug, I, I was something else that came to mind, actually. I'm not sure whether everybody understands this. But the paranoid among us, they put, of course, stickers on the cameras on their phones and their laptops. But you should, what you don't, what you cannot do, I mean, every mobile phone can be turned into a remote microphone. Even if it's switched off, the only thing you can do is take out the battery, which of course you can't do in the recent phones anymore. So more or less you can not be in the same room as a phone and have a secure conversation. And of course, in the 80s when this feature was invented and added to our phones, okay, it was not possible to do this for all citizens. But today, in principle, you could do it, maybe not for bandwidth reasons, but you could actually apply it to hundreds of thousands of people and do use data processing to see what is happening and this conversation is interesting or not. And this is kind of the, the, the problem of the bug. Also, bugs, can, which were targeted, can now become mass surveillance because technology allows mass surveillance through bugs. And in fact, we all voluntarily buy such a device and put it in our pockets. backdoors, how to, uh, to provide this uh, technologically uh, lawful access to data. So this is the, the, the challenge. So assume there are no bags, bugs, no backdoors, how to provide this? So this yeah, well, uh, I wanted just to, um, you know, e even though the challenge that we're posing is really in regards to targeted surveillance, I see the discussion is moving towards mass surveillance. and. Um, and uh, so I, I would like to maybe hear uh, the panelists. Uh, um, could the ultra high assurance standards, as they can benefit uh, defensive technologies, you know, secure communication technology, and benefit also the assurance of cyber investigation tools, you know, for targeted? Couldn't the same standards apply? 
apply to the way that uh, government use in devices that decide uh, with the camera if the guy is speeding, I save the data. If the guy is not speeding, I don't save the data. If I cannot trust that technology and the process that makes that technology, no, the, the, I cannot trust this process that my, 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 uh, my uh, plate has got anyway. Couldn't these same technologies, which are hundreds of times more uh, hardened than the uh, current one, be used uh, on the server side when the data is stored and is, uh, is manipulated so as to ensure that the way it's stored and meaning is manipulated is according to law and constitution? So, um, uh, so the possibly, uh, no, the idea is that if we have much higher levels of assurance, this could be applied at the filter of what actually decides what is collected, and then when it's collected, ensuring that only a computer looks at the data and not humans. Because the problem is not that the computers manipulate and store the data. The problem is that some humans use that to exercise power on other humans. So, and that's the kind of assurance we need those from those systems. Can I play Cassandra then for a moment as well and say, you really won't like this, Lupo, but if we have these ultra high assurance technologies, do those of us who decide to use them then put a big target on our backs? Our, we single ourselves out. So it's the self selecting that I mean, the former CIA chief said, yes, we know people who use end to end encryption, they're the ones we look for. I mean, isn't getting scale more important than getting, because it's very hard to find a needle in a haystack but it's even harder to find a needle in a massive big stack of needles. So by being the needle who's got privacy, you actually sort of define yourself. So should we be going more for volume rather than ultra high assurance? Uh, well, absolutely, I agree. I mean, current technologies, o o nearly all technologies that like end-to-end uh, -end application, signal, or crypto phones, Tor, and so on, it's been proven that they are mostly flagging yourself. Everybody who downloads uh, a Tor browser on a website is automatically put on a, on a special list on NSA for special attention. And uh, so, so mostly by downloading the stuff, you're just signaling if they didn't know already that you are worth for some special attention. But if you have devices that, uh, uh, no, um, that really are beyond the capability of a government to, to access without legal uh, and constitutional access, then flagging yourself shouldn't be a, uh, I mean, that's not, uh, you know, empower more your attacker. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, I would like to give you my, my we could say technical legal opinion, uh, just to make some, a, a big distinction, then I arrive at your question, Rufo. Uh, the first issue is the lawful hacking uh, is something that happens now. Uh, it I, I was involved personally and professionally in the hacking team case, and then if I have time, I will explain something about that case because it's really interesting. But uh, coming back to the question is, there are as many, many EU states that now are trying to uh, make legal the lawful hacking. In Italy, we have a, a bill that is a really interesting bill. We have in France, from 2011, the possibility to make from the law. So is we could say that is constitutional, the lawful hacking from 2011 in France, from 2015 in Spain, in Portugal. There is a discussion, there is a, 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 disc a debate between the fact that it is legal or, or, or not because the, the article is not clear, but anyway, there is an article that mentions this possibility. So we have to clarify that uh, the possibility to make to hack a computer is something that is uh, uh, already in, in place. Uh, uh, obviously, it, we need a court order, but also about this we have to discuss about the court order because there is a big difference b if the court order is made by a judge, so is it is like a warrant uh, in the United States system, or is a court order uh, or is an order made by the prosecutor? For example, in Italy, we had a lot of co court order that are made. Uh, oh sorry, not court order, but a order made by from prosecutor. And also on this part, uh, there is a huge difference. Then coming back to your question, you, s you mentioned the Microsoft case. You have to remember that uh, the uh, Electronic Privacy Communication Act, and specifically the Store Communication Act, uh, and specifically the Section 22702, gives the possibility to the U.S. Pro to the U.S. provider to uh, give uh, without any uh, legal procedure data uh, data retention uh, files so log file and this kind of we could say traffic data to make a, a clear distinction this does not uh, uh, be the same for the content data so there is this distinction that we have to make then coming back to you Rufo, and then I finish 
I think that your sol the, the solution, the high uh, um, uh, insurance, uh, sorry, uh, solution that I, I've read your paper is really interesting. I, I'm really scared about uh, the, 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 the jury uh, and the, the choice of the 10 people that has to, <laughs> we could say, uh, work. And also I see a, 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 a lot of problems regarding jurisdiction. We have to fix uh, the jurisdiction issue. But in principle, it's not unconstitutional. So I think that this system could work, but uh, it could work only if we put this uh, kind of instrument uh, in a convention. I think that we need uh, an import. I, my, 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 my solution is uh, to work on a convention, to a new convention on cybercrime. If you remember, there was the convention of 2001. We have to rethink at the convention, and we can discuss this kind of system in this kind of field. If not, uh, it's difficult, because when you, ch when you quote uh, the Brazilian case, the Serpro case, uh, yes, it's true, there is a similar <coughs> situation, there is a, an analogy, but it's just for Brazil. So it's, it's a single state. You think at the system that work uh, globally. So I think that this is my, it's a question for you. How can you manage this kind of system <coughs> if you, uh, how can you choose, for example, uh, the, 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 the jury, the, the person that, are ma the, ma the, that has to make the, this kind of, the, that have the dangle, and then uh, uh, around Europe, around uh, uh, where? So this is my, 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 my issue is that per perhaps you have an answer. Yeah, very, very briefly, uh, very briefly, I should say, uh, beginning at the, uh, the introduction of the event, uh, we clarified that we're not advocating and, and talking at, at, uh, at uh, in pr proposing new legislations or constitutional changes. What we propose, the certification body, the creation of the certification body that would set the standards, doesn't presuppose any change on legislation uh, and will still have a benefit because it would set standards that IT provider could be free to comply to and within current laws, especially in Italy, given uh, also analysis that uh, Giuseppe helped help us do it, would enable them to legally vet requests by the government to access or not uh, uh, those things. So there'll be a lot of value just without uh, hoping for treaties and so on and so forth. That said, of course, there would be a great value if then government would actually um, uh, you know, give preference to these systems, adopt them internally, they could promote uh, research in these systems and so on. Um, and the other observation you made is that you now some of the ideas we put forward in uh, for as a solution, and this uh, differs our, our ideas from uh, Jovan, is that more than counting on advanced crypto solutions like secret sharing and threshold cryptography, we apply secret sharing and crypt threshold cryptography to people. So we have uh, you know the idea of a citizen witness and citizen jury. Uh, make so that you can create uh, a uh, decentralization of trust without adding to the complexity of the IT systems involved. And by, by relying on some procedures that have been working in the electoral processes, which is different from the electoral campaign and, and campaign finance laws, which you know, are, are a big problem, but the electoral process, in, in, uh, having these five people that are in the ballot booth, you know, always there, that's what we, you know, we think that uh, may have some keys. Uh, no, together with uh, the, the technologies. They need access to keys, uh, so physically. It's better to do it online electronically than physically uh, on the spot. Right. The, the the always use the microphone so we, uh, we get recorded. Okay, I use the microphone. <laughs> 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 because I, I understand what my, my uh, neighbor here says. Uh, we if we want a cross-border system, we need some legal instruments. Otherwise, a German ICT uh, organization or, or co uh, provider uh, would not react on any others uh, other requests. So there, there should be an official request. And also the, the about the juries, we don't have very good ex uh, um, good experiences with such constructions. Uh, uh, what what we see. So this is at least not. Right now, perhaps not sufficient. The idea is not, not necessarily bad, but then there needs much more discussion to really decide on uh, when should there be what access or what not. And on the full debate, I also want to challenge again what the, about the canvas gang or so. We, we discussed now very often you could uh, be under the radar, so saying uh, changing the, the number plates, for example. So the, the key encryption, we can encrypt with other keys. But also, of course, we could have alarm 
any need of, of, uh, of um, collecting data. And so there are so many different solutions uh, that very often a technical solution which is uh, universal and flexible again is a risk. So because then the access may be for everything which is possible and it's very hard really understand you, you want to give me the data otherwise there will be a shitstorm uh, this may be my may may be more uh, convincing to any jury member for example than uh, having the real law and therefore i think we need if we want a, a big solution we need something like a cyber crime uh, convention even if it's very very difficult to achieve this goal but isn't aren't we then still at the point of presupposing that the law enforcement knows that a piece of data exists and they can't know it exists unless they're trawling everything. So they won't ask, you mean? Yeah. If they don't ask, there's no case? <laughs> okay. <laughs> or or do, you, do you now want to have a, a <laughs> data retention for everything which might be in I'm the future? I'm just playing devil's advocate. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants that in the room, I guess. No, I, I think uh, I want to comment on what Giuseppe said on the jurisdiction because I think that is that's one of the crucial uh, issues that, that need to be addressed. I mean, if we, uh, this whole backdoor debate, the, the, the second crypto war, whatever, um, this is not a technical issue. I mean, we can talk about maybe uh, t technical systems that provide uh, certain guarantees for access. The problem is that as soon as you try to think about these systems, you have to think about the following question. Who gets the access? If we design a system that gives the Dutch or the Belgians or the Americans access, then we are also designing systems that give the Syrians, the Chinese and Russians access. There is not a, a reasonable way to try to distinguish this. And if there were, then actually you're, you're sort of back to square one because this whole discussion started with the fact that the Dutch police, uh, if they want to have data, you gave the example of the, 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 the Americans and wanting access to data that is stored in Ireland. They, the, the problem is that they cannot normally get this access except by going through m uh, multilateral uh, agreements, and that's not what they want. So, I mean, if, if, you, if you're thinking about uh, the, this whole si idea of uh, providing access, uh, governmental access to data, then you're actually thinking about a system that allows one country to access data of citizens from another country, and then, okay, that basically means that everybody gets access to everything. So th I think that is where the real problem lies. I don't think the problem is in the technology. I think the problem is in the use of the technology. I have a very genuine question that I would like to know the answers to. Why don't they want to go through the MLATs? I mean, it there is there it's to be few months <laughs> because if you if, if the Dutch <laughs> ask the uh, Ukrainian uh, or the Russian government to get the data, they don't get the data. Well, the but the they would the MLAT Irish MLAT authorities in this case. And there's not even an MLAT maybe in that yeah. case, yeah. There is a study that concluded it takes an average of 12 to 15 months, which is trying to excuse the rationale for me for the police to even bend the law to go after criminals. So that's, uh, that's, that's a political problem. It also has to do a little bit, I think, with the technology uh, and uh, how this, uh, this information is exchanged. So I could see a, a genuine judge being concerned about you know, what this information, you know, how then this information is used and abused because of their system. But it's mainly, I think, an international uh, interjurisdictional exchange uh, information problem. Uh, sorry, uh, Reinhard, did you, were you nodding? No. Okay, I mean, to move on a little bit then from this idea that there are ways for the authorities who want access to specific information to get it. There are MLATs, they probably could have got it. Um, I mean, or if we look at the, the San Bernardino iPhone, they tried to force Apple and Apple wouldn't do it, but they got into the phone anyway. I mean, is there a sense, <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling very fatalistic now, I mean, is, it, is there a real possibility that we can create meaningful privacy and meaningful protection of civil rights. And are those two things the same? Well, but I think the fact that I mean, there is now an attack to a backdoor, there is also an attack le leaked this week to the, the flash reset. So, but of course, these are kind of laborious attacks. And the backdoor may be scalable, but in general, I, I think in principle, you could, you will still have zero days and problems, but I think you could increase the security level. So I think that, I agree we could do much better than we do today. But, and of course, in exceptional cases, people who invest a lot of money, it's very hard to protect against them. This, I think that's the reality today. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. And of course, in, in, in the San Bernardino case, it was, also, it was more like a showcase. They, didn't, they had already the metadata, they had the other phones were burned. It was kind of very likely there would not be much there. It was just a, 
a typical case where they wanted to have the debate, right? I mean, the, this, the, this, they knew there would be no sympathy. Uh, the guy's privacy was no longer at stake because he was dead and so on. So I think it was a carefully chosen and crafted case to go, go after Apple and actually and to, to get things they, they should not be getting. Okay. I, and maybe to add to that, I think that it's a, there's a very important distinction to be made between access to communication data and things that's being said on, in, during an online communication and access to stored data on devices. The second thing is actually, li like Bart said, much easier to protect and make and, and say much easier to make uh, proportional. You re I mean, you can design it in such a way that you need physical access to the device in order to get access to the data, which by definition means that it's much harder for law enforcement to, to collect lots of data about lots of devices because they need to collect each and every individual device. Um, so th there's a big distinction here that I think we need to be aware of. Why not raising the bar? Uh, without having some technical possibilities, only perhaps relying on the old-fashioned stuff by breaking, uh, on, uh, breaking in or so. What would happen is they would be bought for a lot of billions of dollars and then the profit would be changed. I think that's what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> they would not be stopped. You would not be stopped. You would just be acquired and changed. And I think it, you would have to actually create dozens of companies um, to actually win this. And I still want to come back on, on the reality is that where do you get, I mean, we, we still don't know, it's an interesting research problem, where it is backdoor access to the, the voice channel of GSM is, but if it's in the baseband chip, where will you buy your baseband chip, Rufo, for this device? Because every baseband chip you can buy is backdoored, and the well, question is, and the, I think an interesting question is, what about 3G? So. We don't know because for the, the other story leaked, but maybe also for data bits there is a similar functionality in the, the future chips where actually that the governments have universal access already today, but they will keep this secret. Yeah, so that's why well, I've been proposing to have a, a, a European funded open baseband. Uh, yeah, if I can, an if I can answer. Because yeah. of exactly this reason. I, yeah. if, I, if I can answer down in the 140 pages of the research proposal. <laughs> detail of the fact that these devices don't have a baseband processor because there's no way, uh, no, by definition, and by requirement of the state requirement of what they should do, there's no way to have them uh, uh, verifiable. There are some companies like JSM Cryptophone which have invested huge amounts of money to create a firewall around the baseband processor. So you could have devices which don't have a baseband processor, just have a, a Wi-Fi connector, which you don't even need to trust because all communication, when it gets to the chip, it already assumes it as an hostile uh, device. And you have a, a really simple uh, uh, computing base. It could be 3,000. There are hypervisors now that are done with 3,000 lines of code. Cell 4 is 9,000 lines of code. And so, uh, so you would not have a baseband processor and many, not even a graphic uh, processor um, uh, unit. What's the pitch to consumers um, mm -hmm. with, with all of this? What's, <coughs> what, what is the pitch to consumers with all of this? Uh, that they shouldn't get something that, that's then de you know, developed in some other country where, you know, they say developed in Iceland, let's say the pirates take over in Iceland and they become a major software development hub and um, they go, stuff this, we're not doing anything that has anything to do with governments at all. We don't want anything that's going to, to facilitate lawful access, et cetera, et cetera. What's the pitch to consumers that they should go, uh, you know, for something that uh, that buys into this whole thing? Is, is, is it sort of a sense of civic responsibility or, or what? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, as far as what is the uh, consumer pitch and so on, I mean, uh, we had this concept about the, the, the possibility to create these kind of devices, but they needed to have lawful access systems that can actually be secured. But the media and experts uh, don't have no don't, don't think that uh, this stuff already exists. So whatever you're creating, it's not really competitive because people think that the iPhone is uh, doesn't have a backdoor. But then there was a few articles that put it very uh, succinctly, saying the firmware upgrade of all your phones when your iPhone is upgraded, it is a backdoor because what do you know about how it is secured that the firmware upgrade actually is is installing uh, no, uh, no no something that makes it more secure uh, rather than less even if it's the original firmware what the hell do you know about the firmware if if it's good <laughs> and if it's, if they didn't put you know special access for others so so there is already a backdoor so a solution like this is taking it away and it makes it you have to walk in and convince five a jury of five people to and able to access a key which is, in, is somewhere else. If I can just throw something sort of uh, back at that one. Um, most people, I would posit, don't care. Um, there are some, uh, you know, if they uh, have a, an, a high ultra-secure device or not. Um, you have 
use cases who do. You have uh, people in corporate, uh, government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for most people, these are not the threat actors that they're worried about. They're worried about, uh, you know, sort of, sort of, let's say, low-level cyber criminals and whatnot. If they're worried about anything at all, that's just a theory. Yeah, of course, this kind of uh, ultra assurance device would protect you from governments and, of course, also from your neighbor. <laughs> so. I think I, I fully agree with your assessment that most people don't care, but as soon as this thing will start controlling devices in your body and control your house <coughs> and control everything else, control your self-driving car, I think then suddenly there may be a flip and then people may realize this is actually a matter of life and death and personal safety and health and I think then people will expect to have very high, much higher standards and expectations and be willing to pay the price. Well, I hope you're right, but um, just on my opinion, it's not a question, but I think, I mean, we're talking very, I mean, everyone in this room is, well, most people in this room are well over 30. I mean, millennials um, have an entirely different uh, perspective on what security and privacy they're entitled to. I mean, that, that they even feel is, is, a, is a right. I mean, it's a really, so, I mean, you say that, you know, once chips start controlling things, People will think, oh, I want them to be more secure. But that's to assume that people have an expectation of security that predates the, I'm not putting this very well, that predates the, the sort of the chip in everything, the, you know, the, the pacemaker, the, you know, um, that is a threat to your health. It may just be that, you know, oh, yeah, some people die. <laughs> Well, for, you know, yeah, I mean for, for, for security, we don't know. For privacy, we do know. I mean, people like Zuckerberg keep change, saying this and repeating this mantra, and, and the press, to some extent, copies this. But then if you look at studies, it turns out that 16-year-olds have three Facebook accounts, mm. one for their friends, one for their parents, and one for their grandparents. And, of uh, course, they, uh. they show selective information to each of them. And this is clear evidence that they actually do care what they share with whom. Of course... They, we've raised them in a world in which society thinks it's acceptable to give all your data to Facebook and to the NSA, but this is something we have created. That's what they, they grew up in it. Yeah. That was our mistake, right? But they seem to take it natural that it has to go to Facebook. Well, we can actually show them it doesn't have to go to Facebook. You can have the benefits of social networks without having your data in Facebook, but that's something we should be blamed for. <laughs> but at least from this kind of the fact that they have three accounts, we do understand that even this generation has a sense of privacy and control over your own information. Okay, that's a lot more optimistic. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. Generally, studies of uh, internet pro service providers show that, in fact, about 50% of people care about privacy. So it depends on the age also. The youngsters do not care and whatever. But uh, in principle, uh, the percentage is significant. Uh, about 700, uh, this is what Bruce Schneier is saying, 700 million people changed their behavior on the internet after Snowden revelations. So people generally uh, care about privacy. So here the issue is, if we want to continue to, to live in the current world, well, the, all the devices basically have backdoors, so there is no meaningful privacy there, or, or data protection or to have ultra high insurance, at least for some applications, devices, uh, where the data is protected against criminals, so there is cyber security, and the conditions under which the data can be accessed are strictly controlled, again, by the uh, ultra, high, ultra high insurance devices. So this is, this is the point. I believe that the second is, uh, I, I prefer the second solution because the first solution leads to a jungle, and this is what we have nowadays, totally uncontrolled, who can access, who cannot access. Uh, and uh, of course, the, 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 the question of this panel is how, how to enable with these devices, with these tools, secure hardware, software, everything, uh, all the chain, how to enable lawful access. So still, I have not heard any other solution except the key recovery. So you need to recover the key at some point, whatever, either, either by, by, by electronically, by shared key escrow, or physically, as Rufo is, is proposing under given conditions. 
So uh, th 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 this is the point. If you have any other technologi technological solution, that would be fine. And then yet there is another big problem that Ruth already mentioned. We didn't discuss that. How to prevent abuse of this technology, so of, of these technologies. How to prevent abuses. So this is the big point. May I? Um, I find it interesting that you just said that there have been no other proposals when there have been multiple, uh, multiple times the proposals that you could go back to what you were. It's not working, right? No, it's working. Uh, that you could go back to what you were doing before. That there's, if there's a crime, there's usually always a physical part involved in the crime, and you try to attack this physical vector. You go back and do something to the device, or you go back and track this person in the physical way like you used to do in the part. Like it's the same that in, in we had this huge argument when uh, Silk Road was closed down. And people were like going on, oh, it's the Tor network, and it's the anonymity, and it's screwing us all over because we couldn't investigate. But the drugs are physical goods that can be investigated somewhere where it's produced. And I don't see um, why law enforcement usually seems to pretend that that is impossible nowadays. Uh, so that I think there's, there's definitely technologies beyond key recovery that allow you to get access to the data. Uh, the for example, the revocable privacy concept that I explained to you, that's not only limited to the devices, that also applies to data. In fact, the example that you gave about attribute-based credentials, there are, uh, for instance, attribute-based credential implementation that, can, that you can only use for a limited amount of times, and then after that, your anonymity is revoked. So even in that context, there are possibilities to get to the data uh, without getting access to the keys. Biggest point. I would like to give some two, two issues uh, from the recent regulation of the data protection, uh, data protection regulation, and specifically, I think that every one of us for always forget the directive uh, uh, six, uh, six, 680 of 2016 regulating the relation between uh, privacy and law enforcement. So. The, the title is wonderful. I think the content of that directive is not so wonderful, but this is a, a personal comment. The point is, um, this is, di is, a, is a directive, so every single state has to apply this directive. And this is a good starting point. I appreciate that uh, you have a, a, a good situation now in your country, but I think that this in Italy is quite different when you mention your experience as a data protection officer, uh, sorry, commissioner. <coughs> um, I think that we have to think from that uh, part and then uh, the data protection regulation uh, we mentioned before the nice directive uh, uh, you Yes, directive. Um, I think that the article 42 of this uh, regulation is really interesting because uh, it involved the certification process and the certification standards and I think that it goes in the in the, in the right direction because if a company Correct me if I'm wrong. Want to avoid want to avoid the data breach, as to demonstrate that uh, as organization a measure and and so on, and it needs to be certificated. Certificated. So basically, I think that we need to use also this kind of certification process uh, to give the possibility to uh, create a safer and more. Um, uh, motivated company. Another thing that was uh, mentioned today, I think that you you were the person I don't remember who tell that there is no motivation to for the company uh, to to be to to be more safe and to create security uh, products. I think that one motivation could be, as we said before, the reputation damage that you have in a case of a breach. N from 2018, when you have a breach, every single company, not only critical infrastructure company, has to uh, advise the single user. Think of the company that has uh, one million customer has to advise immediately in a clear way that they receive a breach to every single customer of the company, yeah. unless you have a certification. So I think that we need to use also this instrument to. Im to, to create more awareness uh, about this, uh, and especially in the IoT scenario, because every single uh, developer, uh, producer, needs to apply the data protection regulation. So it's an instrument that we can use. And I really like the Article 42, as I said before, of the data protection regulation. These are my two last thoughts about the security issue.
Okay. If I may okay. ask you a question to Bart, since our lunch area has been outtaken uh, by our neighbors, <laughs> so we have maybe we have to take uh, 10 more minutes. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Bart, not taking out no, from the comment uh, of uh, Johan, there is a large consensus for 30 years that any solution that involves uh, key recovery, uh, key escrow, third party solution, uh, no, is nonsense because it will uh, it will uh, inevitably create unacceptable risks for large scale compromise of privacy of citizens. What you know, what uh, we are suggesting in this uh, challenge is that possibly there are ways in which, through extreme technical, social technical standards, very simple technology, and these uh, you no know, you know, human processes, that this risk uh, could be reduced to an acceptable level. And of course, we're talking about something that is autonomously done by the provider, is not regulated nor mandated by the, by the state, but it's delegated to an external, um, technically proficient, citizen accountable, external non-governmental body. And um, so is, is it uh, feasible to arrive to acceptable levels? Or, or, or at the very least, can, it, can we do you know, substantially better than today? Because is today you know, uh, compliance to lawful access request access, uh, acceptable? Now, we mentioned before about Apple and their standards, now having this attorney, completely black box technologies, firmware upgrade. So uh, can we improve <laughs> towards that? So even though we may not reach acceptable, can we substantially improve on what it is there today? I saw you so shaking your head. For Bart, uh, but okay. anyway. Well, I guess we could, we, I don't think there has been much effort on this. We could think about the problem, okay? But I think before you can actually try to make progress, you first have to understand what the goals of the system are. And again, if you have a person, so citizen A, residing in country B, communicating with a device or, or with software or an app from country C, and then there is the other party um, is communicating with or exchanging with is actually in another set of countries Then they use a service in a third set of countries and I have already in a trivial example with two users and one service I have now nine countries involved. Maybe citizenship doesn't matter, although for the US it does. So you now have nine countries involved. So I'm not a lawyer, but I would think there is now two to the nine legal cases, that's five, twelve legal cases to be looked at. So who is going to get the keys now in this system? Or who, I think the first question will be which jurisdiction does apply? <laughs> And then who will get the keys? And so if you don't have this answer, and you say, oh, it's only for national communication inside a particular country, well, then, then the criminals will actually make sure that they're international, and then uh, your system will not be used to them. I think once we understand that, then we can design a system. Because I was involved in, in a project in 95 where we looked at this problem for 3G. So there was a plan to have end-to-end -end encryption in 3G, and in fact, GCHQ pushed Vodafone to make a design, mm -hmm. and more or less the only thing they could come up with was a system which was the weakest as the weakest part, which means that in any country you could access to all the communications. That was the, the answer because <laughs> that was what the lawyer said. This seems to be the deadlock there. And if we can't solve this, I think looking at the technical question is nice to fill the academic literature, but it's not going to change the world. Um, um, ha having listened to the discussion, I'm not so clear uh, what part we are discussing. Are we uh, trying to increase the security? Are we trying to uh, enable lawful access? For my part, I like the Italian way of eating salad, <laughs> which means I get the salad and the oil. There's no use for the oil without salad, so there's no use for lawful access if you don't communicate. But w w we probably should change uh, the, the sentence, in my view, a little bit, saying uh, provide ultra-high assurance and ICD devices with voluntary compliance. Think about that. If the use of the device is voluntary, why should the compliance part uh, be voluntary, not no, be well, voluntary? Sorry, the because the is uh, of the provider. Yes. Sorry, so the, the, the providers so are in Europe now. If you now, now what, what, let, let me continue. Uh, what this says, a provider is only allowed to use high security if, and this is, uh, uh, I think, discriminating uh, European providers. That's why I'm saying let's think about putting the voluntary ahead of compliance. 
after high assurance and then you don't comply, they, uh, then uh, you will have abuses. So this is the point. You so need you, to, you need to bind. You you need to bind somehow ultra high assurance to this lawful access. Then we have first to agree that we forbid certain products. Well, they don't do exist today. No, 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 they they don't exist. Yeah. Exist. We want that to exist. Uh, mm -hmm. for that to come mm -hmm. to market and not be outlawed yeah. the next day. That is the concept. That's a, the neither the either both or neither. I mean, that, that could be challenged. I mean, if we had perfect technology, which is perfectly secure, and it's out there, and the NSA cannot crack it and so on, would they let it be? Should they let it be? I think they shouldn't. Because you have millions of really pissed off people with access with petrol dollars yeah. that if they put their hands on this kind of uh, technology, that could enable them to do very, very major damage. I mean, we have a, a director of research of a nuclear agency. I mean, there's uh, very dangerous stuff that could happen. I don't know, that's a personal opinion. We're getting into geopolitics, but... Uh, I mean, bad people are going to do bad things, and they don't necessarily need to use... I don't send carrier well, pigeons. I, I, mean <laughs> I, I don't get an argument. I mean, no. uh, <laughs> bad people can use concrete and, and high railways exactly. to do bad stuff, and we have yeah. that stuff. So that's really not the argument. Uh, well, with concrete, they can do ma ma major damage. If you have you know, well-trained, well-financed you know, uh, military, military terrorists that, that are allowed, to, okay, if you have, you know, I'm, I'm describing like very simple you know, how anti-terrorism at a global scale works. If you have a, a few tens of, of people, very well-trained, military, very pissed off, you know, fanatical, possibly with also some very valid excuses of what happened historically in the last uh, decades in their part of the world, and they have access to petrol dollars, and you don't control these petrol dollars getting to these people, and you don't have a way to track these people's communications in, in the crypto. Of course, these, com these people communicate also on clear channels, talking about you know, when are we going to meet to exchange those uh, donuts. But you know, having crypto also uh, provides much more, and that's, of course, that's a major problem. So we live in a, in a world in which you have these kind of threats. Uh, some people say, oh, but uh, no, think bad things happen anyway. But no, you have small accidents. No, what things could happen, you could have you know, these people putting their hands on nuclear weapons and so on and so forth. <laughs> so there are huge threats that we have you know, uh, public agencies uh, protecting. I, I don't think that, that, that a very dedicated group of people that you're describing, that we are going to think that there's going to be any way that you're going to stop them from getting access to secure communications. No way. There's not n whatever you try to do, they will have they will have the ability to do secure communications. This part is affordable or not. So whether it's feasible by well, of course, getting some funding money. If we use or those use those uh, petrol dollars, of course, perhaps they have built already the system you're looking for, but only without the access or with access for them or so. On. So I think we should. Think that what is the think about improving security and privacy in the systems. This there may be different ways. We have not agreed on on any of those, but uh, already seeing the ultra high um, term only with the combination of uh, an unspecified access. This is probably not sufficient. I, I just wanted to quickly answer. Bart is saying now that terrorists mostly use burner phones and so on. The greatest terrorists don't even use that. They use just pizzini, piece of paper. Obama or mafia only use piece of papers that were done. And that, of course, severely limits their ability to coordinate and slows their coordination. If they could actually put their hands on something they could trust as much as their pizzini, you, you can have a lot of trouble. That, and so, so there is not a going dark, there is a not gone dark, there is not a going dark, but they could go dark if we could actually build that kind of technology. Uh, so, uh, so I think there is a genuine uh, problem to be uh, done. That's why the two, uh, I think, uh, the two problems we think uh, may be linked. I mean, I think it comes back down to, I mean, it's, it's very basic principles. Do you have a, a, a legal system where you say, I would rather 10 guilty men go three free than one innocent man get sent to jail. Or do you not? Or do you say, oh, well, there's a few innocents go to jail, but we get all the bad guys. I mean, taking that approach. But it's not only jail. It's uh, discrimination. Yeah. It's about reputation. It's, uh, it can be Guantanamo. Uh, it can be ve something without any court involvement. So I think the, the, the risks are very high, not only, well, only one one innocent per person or something. I'm also very conscious that we're all very white privilege in this room. There's very few men, there's yeah. not even very many women in this room. 
And the people who are most surveilled and suffer most from breaches of their personal privacy are the underclass, they're the poor, they're the people who can't afford. I mean, we've already created a world where privacy is something that's for the middle classes and the well-to-do. And I'm just very concerned that that's not a good um. place. I've stopped being a moderator, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, d d d just one last thing. You know, even though we don't agree about the actual need for uh, public security, you know, for great th threats of terrorist acts, uh, if uh, uh, somewhat the ability to crack uh, crypto communications is uh, is decreased as to now. Now they're fine. They can crack everything. No, I don't agree with uh, with uh, almost everything with the app. Um, even though we don't, we don't agree, most people. Do you think so? Do you think that uh, if there is an, uh, if there is a, a risk that this crypto communication used by by uh, to, to if p 50 people die, now we've seen it with Paris attacks, that's enough to say to sacrifice all the privacy because it's harder to quantify the damage to society. society. So even tactically, as privacy advocates, uh, we may want to uh, think that uh, we would be really difficult even in decades to convince people to choose if they have to choose between uh, safety. And, uh, private and, and, and freedom if they would choose freedom. If you ask me, I have a family, I have two kids, I choose safety. That, that, <laughs> that was not the I, the, I, I mean, <laughs> just, just to be very clear, <laughs> just to be very so clear that was not the point <laughs> I was making. <laughs> <laughs> that was not the pain, uh, point I was making. I mean, I think you can, you can try to, to create a public infrastructure that is government sponsored or government led or whatever, state led, where you actually want to reconcile both principles. The only point I was making that the very um, dedicated group of people that you were describing will not use that infrastructure. They will design their own infrastructure, and there's no way that you can prevent that from happening. That's not bad. It's just that you should be aware of that fact that that's not gonna, that is not going to stop those. It will make their life a bit harder. It's not going to stop them. That's all. That that's I think something that you should be very clear about. That being said, you still can make that infrastructure um, trying to balance all these different requirements. I think th this is a very uh, clear point, uh, saying if, if you build such a because they know this is there, uh, they, they, they would be silly in using it. So they will use something on top so that you don't get the, uh, or they will use something aside. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is what was in the discussion uh, previously when we had key recovery, et cetera, et cetera. You will get you know, the average criminal who uh, steals 2,000 euros um, where, where, you, where this is not worth using these tools. But you will not get the, you know, the really top criminals uh, who know, and, and in practice that's true. I've been involved in some of these cases. Uh, uh, they, they are using very, very funny, very specific tools which has nothing to do with what we are using. Yeah. Currently, criminals are, uh, are very, very exposed to backdoors from the fabrication of OS and so on, so there's very, very limited amount, if any, of the criminals that can actually have. The one example is Crypto AG. You know, Bart knows all about this. You know, for many decades, the best crypto phone ever was from Switzerland, was supposed to be in a, a net neutral country. Then, after a few decades, it came out that NSA was in deep agreements uh, with this uh, with these uh, companies to have backdoors at very low levels, so that they could spy on uh, third world dictators, and, and that was you know very important strategically, you know, for uh, no, uh, for what's that? And, and 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 the allies and so on. And in fact, you no, know, Crypto AG was then owned by by Siemens, and Siemens paid uh, a ransom in Iran. So there's all kinds of stories that are not been. Uh, so so basically, even today, you have the same scenario. And in fact, those all this also explains why many many claim that uh, intelligence don't need any. Uh, more, uh, they have no problem of going dark uh, because now they, they can demonstrate the fact that crypto have prevented them to stop uh, uh, terrorist uh, attacks and so on. And uh, I, I would uh, argue that um, the intelligence agency cannot uh, say how broken everything is out there, so they have to claim that they're going dark because otherwise criminals would not use it and they cannot spy them. Okay, so it's in their interest to hype uh, current. Uh, Privacy technology, just like is in the interest of some media media entities to you know hype any new thing uh, that is coming out just because uh, it's a new thing you know and uh, it should be something uh, notable advanced on, on privacy. Uh, so so this is um, maybe some distortions. Uh, 
But this means we need transparency mm. for mm. everything, for the risk of everything which is out there. Some possibilities to really connect our cars, our uh, homes or so with ICT, because uh, with pacemakers, uh, some people have e already decided that they don't want the hackable pacemaker uh, uh, implemented. So this means that it's not about built-in security, but uh, building out technology out of some systems. And people who say we cannot be part of this technology-driven society because of our privacy, security, whatever risk. But this means we need transparency, discussing very well what is ha happening, not only the after-the-fact thing for suspects who were then uh, turned out to be innocent, but for the, the structure of the system. Bottom line is to improve both cyber privacy and cyber security in cyberspace. So this is the bottom line. And this is becoming very critical with these uh, smart systems, Internet of Things, uh, autonomous systems, mm -hmm. uh, super artificial intelligence in 10, day, uh, ten uh, d uh, years and so on. So we really need to improve that. And we see as a blocking factor this need for cyber investigation. So this is, we, we might wish to reconcile the two. But the bottom line is, of course, the first one. So improve cyber security and cyber privacy. So this is the bottom line. Because m many prob problems are, in fact, coming, it seems so, from government agency and big over-the-top internet providers who are collecting data and